Welcome to Punch Card Investing, a weekly show dedicated to all things value investing. Whether it be analyzing companies, pitching ideas, or discussing moves by the best investors in the world, we're trying to get one step closer to punching an investment off of our cards. Let's, Let's get, get started. started. I forgot to loop the intro clip, so it showed our faces a little early there. <laughs> you were Thank taking you, intro man. What's happening? <laughs> yeah, I was I was looking down at the uh, the media assets we have in here, so it's not ready. <laughs> but we are live. It's good to be back. Um, we're going to be talking about serial acquirers today, among other things. Um, before we get into that, just got to remind everyone to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and leave comments after the show is done, of course, uh, when the comments actually can show. Otherwise, uh, we are looking forward to getting to see uh, what you guys are saying in the chat and get to your questions there later on, too. Um, but otherwise, uh, check out the Discord as well if you're not already in that, and our affiliate links to share site and Seeking Alpha where you can get some discounts there. Um, so, like I said, we're going to be talking about serial acquirers. Um, it's a topic we've been kind of uh, thinking about for uh, a, a few weeks now, but we've just had so much news with a bunch of different, um, all, all the earnings madness and everything going on in the market. It's been pretty crazy. So, so much to talk about, so little time. <laughs> so uh, finally, we can kind of get to this topic that we've been wanting to do. Um, and it comes at an interesting time, I have to say, with FTX, the serial acquirer of the crypto space, going down in flames, right, as we speak. Um by the way, this video is sponsored by FTX. No, it's not actually. Um, <laughs> they, they couldn't pay us off. There's nothing left to pay us off to do that, unfortunately. Um, they, they offered us their, their FTT token or whatever it is. Um, and unfortunately, it's worthless. And, and as, as Luis has, has said with his $2.69, nice cent. Um, Super Chat, he's asking if he should buy the dip in FTX. And uh, Matt has assured him that it's 100% a sure deal. Uh, it seems, seems about right. Um, but <laughs> what a, what a weird, what a weird world we live in that, uh, uh, just seeing uh, the whole financial YouTube space kind of very uncomfortable right now because they, they bought off a lot of YouTubers, not us, not us value people. We're not worth their money. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we, we were not corrupted and we've avoided that thankfully. Um, but man, what a, what a crazy time guys. Uh, what do you make of this whole thing before we actually get into some more? I mean, I don't want to say more serious because it's pretty serious. Billions and billions of dollars down the drain and a lot of people hurt. But uh, any knee-jerk reactions to the FTX news? What's an FTX? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Frank's question, right, on Twitter? Yeah, yeah, he, he asked. Did you guys see the response on there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, he, you, got, you got a lot of responses there. Um, for those of you who aren't following anything with the crypto space, so this one's been getting a ton of media. Um FTX is this giant crypto brokerage, or I guess I should say was, and they do some other things too, more than people might have thought. They lost a bunch of money, uh, apparently are declaring bankruptcy, I think. And uh, yeah, <laughs> that, that's about it. A lot of people are hurt by it. They had tons of sponsorships, really high level sponsorships um, with celebrities and also a bunch of people in the YouTube space as well. So it's relevant to us too. Um, and obviously all the people in the crypto space has, it is, uh, it's seen better days, um, that's for sure. But yeah. yeah, that's about it. Yeah, it seems like just a kind of another another um, <clears throat> another one to add to the history books of speculation and too much leverage, I guess. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Someone uh, someone asked like, is crypto is crypto a Ponzi scheme? It's like, well, it, it's more of like debt on debt on debt on debt. So I don't know if I'd call that a Ponzi scheme, but it's a, a lot of leverage, that's for sure. And uh, it doesn't take too much for a bunch of leverage to uh, blow up. And we've certainly seen that. If the underlying asset value loses steam, you, know, you run into a problem. I guess the end result's the same. <laughs> but yeah. it's a Ponzi scheme, but um, yeah, rough times. Yeah, it's uh, that, yeah. the whole idea of uh, anything multiplied by zero is zero, right? So Yeah, um, pretty much. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Only, only the chances of reaching zero are higher the more leverage you get. But uh, yeah. Any, anyways, I guess uh, I don't know how to transition into serial acquirers outside of the crypto space, but it does bring up the idea of, of these companies that try to acquire their a particular market, a particular industry, um, even 
adjacent or, or, or not that related of industries, uh, conglomerates, if you will. Uh, how do you go about financing these sorts of acquisitions? That obviously matters. Are you diluting people? Are you taking on a bunch of debt? Uh, is there some other like cash? Is it a cash transaction? All that sort of stuff. Uh, pretty relevant. And is this kind of like as a backdrop to, to this? Um, I, I don't know. Well, should we start with a particular company in mind? Uh, well, I I'd, I'd be interested to know if you guys actually have any of what you'd call a serial acquirer in the portfolio. Obviously, um, you know, Frank is pretty well known for being in KPG, which is kind of textbook serial acquirer, I would have yeah. thought. Um, my two biggest yeah. positions are Birch Hathaway and Thor, which have, both yeah. have long you know, track records, different styles, but both acquire businesses over time. So. Yeah, I was going to say Berkshire is the, the first one that comes to mind, which I do own. Um, otherwise, I don't, I don't think they really fit that mold. Some of some have done like some acquisitions here and there, but I wouldn't say it's like their main sort of avenue for growth, which is what I would say the if we're trying to define or narrow our focus here, I think a serial acquirer is probably a business that primarily grows through acquiring other businesses rather than trying to grow things organically or or return all money to shareholders, I guess, or you know, something besides um, uh, growing by acquisition. So I think I think that's probably the is that a fair kind of boundary to put up here? I it's think so. I'm, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, Berkshire obviously has internal reinvestment opportunities, but um, sure. nowhere near what what other types of companies might have. So they sort of pile up cash and, you know, some companies might go down the buyback route or pay it out as dividends. But if you've got good managers in there and, you know, good opportunities to buy more businesses and grow that way, it seems to work pretty well if you can pull it off. Um, it can also work pretty poorly if you don't have the right managers and they make big dumb acquisitions. And I'm sure we'll get into that. Yeah. In this episode. I think I we think see that more often than not. Like you see managers yeah. go in, fill up their own pockets. I mean, yeah. that's kind of the history of conglomerates, right? So, And, and there's, um, and there are a lot of businesses that you wouldn't expect to be doing tons of acquisitions or they're doing them rather quietly. I, I would think you, you might even put like, uh, would you put like Apple into this at all? Um, so I know they have their like huge, like sort of hedge fund arm, if you want to count that. Um, and a lot of the tech firms, at least the big tech firms will have sort of kind of venture capital type acquisitions. Google tries to acquire lots of little things in the hopes that they'll become big things later, you might acquire that. Uh, you might uh, look at that as well, but hard to call them a serial acquirer, but it is a clearly yeah. a big part of some of their focus. Yeah, they're, they're doing lots of them, I think, but that's, they're prob like those small acquisitions, you know, like uh, Apple buying Shazam or whatever to mm -hmm. identify yeah. what song you're listening to. Like that's probably not stuff that moves the needle, whereas it wouldn't be unusual to see Buffett like do a $20 billion acquisition tomorrow, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Something it's, pretty it's more, serious. It's more of like either a lottery ticket or it's like some sort of cost saving to kind of plug into their underlying system rather than trying to... Yeah, ex S grow. synergies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that, that's the word. That's yeah. that's the many billion dollar word. Synergies. Exactly. <laughs> many AI. a management consultant got paid off that yeah. word. AI synergies. Oof, now we're getting into 2022. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, exactly. Hey, there, our, man, in the chat? Our, our man, our man Frank's in the chat. Most acquisitions are value destructive. Some estimates as high as 80%. Serial acquirers are usually the best or worst businesses, not much in between. As someone who looks a lot at serial um, acquirers and acquirers in general, um, I, I would I would trust those numbers from from Frank. Um, but it's a uh, it's a hard game because when you're acquiring a business, you don't really know what you're getting until you actually get it. Um, so there's a little bit of that, even even when you go through all the due diligence, which you which you definitely would do in a multi billion dollar deal, as you sometimes see. Um, but uh, there's plenty of room for error, and you have to outlay a bunch of cash or raise debt or whatever, add risk to the to the pie when you're actually making the acquisition. So I, so that would make some sense. Um, yeah, but when it works, it works. Um, I've just shared my screen, Jack, on what I think is the the goat uh, of. Um... Serial acquirers, can you see that? Okay, this is a this is a photo I took a couple minutes before the stream here of a book. Um, <laughs> but this is this is showing Henry Singleton at Teledyne's track record, and um, he is kind of textbook serial acquirer for at least the first part of his career, and he did in quite an interesting manner. Um, the 
Oh, it's actually got it in a little bit of text down the bottom there. But basically what Henry Singleton was doing is he was issuing stock at ballpark 25 times earnings to buy private businesses at eight times earnings. And he kind of just ran that engine for like a decade straight. And this is pretty much what happened in the first decade. So net income went up 7.1 times, which is um, which is massive growth, obviously. But earnings per share went up about 40 times because he was um, kind of taking advantage of that arbitrage, I guess, between private market and public market valuations. Um, and this is a great example of like where management can come in, um, can definitely come into it if I can go to the next image here. Um, because Henry Singleton, when that arbitrage kind of disappeared or even potentially flipped the other direction, he basically did the exact opposite approach. And um, <laughs> instead of issuing shares, he bought back shares like crazy to the point where um, I think he bought back 90% of his shares. Um, Sounds right. And uh, sorry, I've got things the wrong way around here, haven't I? Uh, that's first decade there. Sorry. So yeah, net income up 555 times, earnings per share up 64 times. Um, and if I can go back, here we go. So this is actually the second decade. Um, shares outstanding going from 6.6 uh, 6 to 0 0.9. Um, so yeah, bought back 90% of the shares outstanding. Earnings per share went from $8.55 to $353. So um, <laughs> in, like, like, in 13 years. <laughs> yeah, that's like all time track record of um, what you'd want to see a manager doing. I mean, basically. it's really simple, actually. He uh, he bought low and sold high, and that's all. That's all there is to it, guys. All right, let's wrap up the show. Go to here first. <laughs> <laughs> but it's um, very similar to what we're seeing with KPG, also. Like they're pretty much following a very similar path, isn't it? Yeah, and and even today, um, like KPG is doing it today, obviously, and plenty of other companies are too, but just, uh, I'll, I'll, t I'll talk about my limited experience in looking at private businesses recently and just the, the, the pricing you see there with like a small private business, it's, it's kind of silly compared to, you know, what we're seeing with some of these high flying company names, um, many of which don't even make money. Um, even after a lot of lost a lot of their value, you could still make a pretty good argument that many are very expensive still. And you can pr pretty much say that at any time, uh, but just seeing the multiples for buying the same dollar of cash flow for a small private business often is much, much lower than uh, some big giant business um, for, for the, for, you know, cash flow is cash flow, but obviously uh, quality matters, liquidity matters and plenty of other the things control there. aspect of it. Yeah. With there's control too. Business. Yeah. And I think right. a lot of it does have to do with just management inefficiencies. Typically when you buy a small private business, you're probably, there's probably something, there that you know otherwise it'd be a big giant business right if everything is correct or <laughs> in quotes there's always something to solve but often there's some operational inefficiency maybe things aren't digitized properly maybe there's there's everything flows through the owner or something so there's uh, when you lose the owner you lose a lot of the operations or something like that um, so it doesn't make sense why they would be cheaper in many cases but even in the cases where they are pretty systematized and you have like a decent management structure then it's often just from a multiple basis much cheaper but it's a different it's a different game because again it's less liquid so if you wanted to get out it's probably going to be a bit harder than if you just bought some publicly traded stock that's already on an exchange it's a lot easier to get in and out uh everything's a trade-off i guess is is um is what i'm really trying to say but the, the singleton model which is like uh sell on the public market buy in the private market more or less <laughs> and when you have some decent management efficiencies in the meantime you can see how powerful it is it's just very hard to execute at scale, obviously. And speaking of Berkshire, maybe now's a good time to talk about them. All right, they've kind of run into that. I don't want to call it a problem, but it's the size problem of uh, it's it's now hard to find those super you know low PE opportunities that have huge upside that would actually move the needle for them because the fund is just so big or Berkshire, the company is so big. Um, but uh, what, what do we make of Berkshire? Since I believe all of us own Berkshire. Kron, you still do this. I don't know if Brad or does Brad I meant, the, I meant or? the three of us. I don't know if Brad does, uh, I, but the three of us do it, right? Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Why? Why do we own Berkshire? Because Warren's it's an the allegiance goat. thing <laughs> <laughs> to the goat. We're all part of the cult. That, that's yeah. what it is. Yeah, that at this point, yeah, the value cult. <laughs> yeah. 
we don't, we don't like it's marketing anything. it's the great marketing that they've got you know like that's <laughs> we're sold on the marketing <laughs> The uh, financial YouTuber sponsorships from Berkshire. Do <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you imagine? Yeah. I do occasionally get um, uh, buy Burke business insurance ads. Uh, very, very occasionally I'll get those. And I think uh, like that, that, that's, that's, that's Uncle Warren sending me an ad on YouTube <laughs> through one of his insurance affiliates. Um, but yeah. What, what, what's what's the big appeal with Berkshire? Is it is it really the growth for acquisition? Is it is it just is it just the cult? I mean, you it's got a big bet, right? Yeah, it's a big bet. So it's like it's like it's structured on those four pillars, as he mentions. Like you've got BNSF, you've got Apple, you've got the insurance business, you've got the energy business, and obviously you've got like the whole bunch of private businesses and and cash stock portfolio and cash. True. Um, Optionality, that's a huge factor. So, I mean, many of the other companies in our portfolio may struggle, but Berkshire always tends to slowly grind ahead. So, so yeah, yeah I mean, that's one of the appeals to have Berkshire in the portfolio. Yeah, I think, yeah. Tom, you were saying earlier, that's one thing that makes Berkshire so po powerful is the uh, that they generate all their internal earnings that they can then go and buy stuff with, um, which is a lot, a lot more sustainable than raising debt or, or diluting to, to make the same acquisitions. Um, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot stronger that way. So if valuations get, get yeah. kind of crazy or if they depress a lot, they, they won't be in big trouble compared to someone who has a ton of, ton of debt to make all these expensive acquisitions. Um, I think even yeah. the debt that they raised, they're kind of like right now, the interest that they're getting on their cash is like a lot higher than the debt they raised like two years ago. I read that yeah, somewhere. Yeah. True. Yeah. And they locked yeah, in you, good rates. <laughs> yeah, if you look at like some of the European or Japanese debt they raised, it's kind of like yeah. laughable the rates they pay on it. And um, I forget the site where you can look up all the like bond prices and stuff, but if you just look up all of the bonds out for Berkshire Hathaway, like the energy subsidiary, um, they're like super long duration. A lot of them, like I believe maturing in like 2040, 2050, a few of those bonds and um, and yeah, like really low rates. And they went out and bought DYD with that money, right? So I think they did pretty okay on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and they're getting a regulated return in a lot of those energy businesses so they can afford to add a bit of leverage. Like it's, it's quite stable. Speaking of the energy business, I saw that they sold off a little bit more of the BYD position. I don't know how much, but I just, it was a headline somewhere. Like uh, like in the last week like or two? Yesterday. All oh, right. I saw it yesterday, yeah. Haven't seen that. I know they sold about eight or 9% of the position in the last, just in the last couple of months. Um, yeah, I hadn't seen the recent update. Yeah, so Berkshire sells $145 million worth of shares. The fighting shows 18 hours ago. Wow. Right. So, yeah, they've that, been trimming. That seems yeah. like single digit percentages of their holding, if I had to guess. Um, yeah. I'm not sure what they're I think they put in like 200 something, right? Initially in 2009, 10. They did, but it's like in, worth in the billions now. It might be in that article. Yeah. Yep, five point seven eight million Hong Kong listed shares of BYD for one point one four billion dollars, which or one point that's Hong Kong dollars, which is one hundred forty five million dollars US yeah, dollars. I think it's like a seven billion dollar position or in that ballpark. So. They have a lot of those little weird kind of trimming transactions. Um, just see that portfolio is so huge. Um, yeah, they seem to have, have done that increasingly over the years. Like they yeah. back in the day with Coke or something, they just never touch it or American Express. And now you've seen him. I think he trimmed Apple a couple of years back slightly. Um, either that or it was Tito Todd. Um, but I think Buffett might have said in an annual meeting he that was him trimming a little. Although now he's turned around and added back to it. So I don't really know what to think of that situation. I think DC requires one thing that you've got is like that whole concept of Peter Lynch's diversification versus diversification. 
Yeah. So that's a huge uh, thing to consider because mostly it tends to be unrelated diversification, which kind of kills the core business or at least drains the core business. So, um, real quick, we're about to make talk it. About meta here. That's we're, different. We're, we're not going to talk about meta. <laughs> real quick, we're going to bring on, we're, we're going to make an acquisition here. Some oh call it diversification. What did we pay, Jack? What a transition, Some, some Jack. call it diversification. <laughs> some call it diversification. Here, here's our very own <laughs> Jason Rothman, the editor investor. Hey. Welcome to the hey, show. <laughs> on on hey. very short notice, we, we appreciate it, Jason. How are you doing? <laughs> good. Good to see you guys. I think uh, I think Brad was out trying to chase down some Carvana stock be before it's too mm. late. So I'm glad to fill, <laughs> yeah. in, fill in for him because I already got mine. How are you guys doing? Speaking of serial acquirers, <laughs> at, at any cost, <laughs> buy at that market cost. share. Um, yeah. uh, well, good to have you. Jason, guys. Jason, do you own any serial acquirers? Serial acquirers. Um, well, Jason's Google. largest position is a serial acquirer. I mean, is it your largest alphabet? Which one is that? It's Google? Like alphabet. Oh uh, yeah, Alphabet. Yeah, are are they considered? Do you guys consider them a serial? I think I think back in the day they made some very good acquisitions. Um, I, I wouldn't call them serial later. acquirers. But I think we were saying earlier they they definitely make acquisitions and, and some good, some terrible, but they're usually pretty small relative to what, what they got on the top. The top. Well, end. I am. This may be news to some people, not to everybody, because uh, I've been influenced by some great investors. But I am back in China. And I have a position in process again. And so they, they make a lot of, a lot of acquisitions, yeah. like a, a really large amount of acquisitions when you start digging into it, I think. Isn't that right, Karan? Yeah, huge. Yeah, I, I was, I, I thought of that earlier too with process. Um, yeah, pretty much anything that's like a fund, I guess, kind of by default is, a, is an acquirer because it's, they're, and they're not necessarily, at some point, they're probably going to be acquiring some other business. They're probably not just sitting on all the cash. Um, maybe they reinvested in themselves, of course, but usually they tend to make kind of the acquisition route, um, at least for some of these bigger funds. Um, Got to keep the people excited, right, with new holdings. <laughs> yeah. Um, my, uh, yeah, my portfolio is just process pretty much, I think, is a serial acquirer. Did you guys have trouble coming up with a list of names? Because nothing besides what the former CEO did at Disney is really grabbing me as an idea to kind of own in on. Um, maybe yeah. it's not the market for it right now. Yeah, I, I think, um, well, it's where it would have been nice to have Frank on because he, he looks at a lot of the smaller cap ones kind of with that model where they're trying to roll up their, their respective small markets. Uh, we, we mentioned KPG towards the top of the show, um, buying up private accounting businesses in Australia, rolling them up into their kind of um, into their public vehicle. That is, that is KPG. Um, and they've done that super successfully. And there are other sort of smaller companies like that in very niche industries. Um, but mm -hmm. we're, 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 every, we're, we're kind of discussing these like huge players that, that acquire all sorts of stuff, Berkshire being an obvious example and others. Um, but I, th I think that's probably where you, it's kind of weird because I feel like you, it, it's either huge kind of mega funds like like Berkshire or something like that, or you have kind of these smaller, very specific industry roll up sort of strategies um, when we talk about serial acquirers. It doesn't seem like there's a lot in between. Maybe maybe I'm yeah. mistaken. I've, I've I see got a few list of one name that comes up all the yeah. time whenever you talk serial acquirers. Yeah. What's that? that? Which one? Constellation software. Oh, Constellation, yeah. I think Brad was interested in Constellation at one point. This is like months back, maybe more than a year ago. But he had mentioned it on the stream. I and, think it was when uh, we first started the show. It was our first like best idea stream, if I remember correctly. Yeah. It was like Topicus and Constellation or something. Yeah, I, yeah. I remember that <laughs> <laughs> kind of distinctly. <laughs> something in that realm. Yeah, I've I've got a few listed down. Like, um, yeah, I've already mentioned Berkshire, Thor, KPG, Markel, Teledyne's an older example. Um, <clears throat> Technion is a business I haven't looked into too deeply, but I've seen a few people speaking about that one. Um, one more, one Water Marine. I think Frank is 
is written about on Twitter before. Um, and I'm sure there's lots I'm missing, but those are a few that I've got noted down. <clears throat> what makes for a good acquirer? And I, I guess I, I kind of wanted to ask about this earlier, but good management manager. incentives are, are something to keep in mind. We, we kind of alluded to it earlier just with, uh, you want to be careful of like specific stock deals with different acquisitions or, or spinoffs, I suppose, that come from acquisitions. Yeah. Um, that can really derail what might seem like a great acquisition, but oh, uh, the the debt ends up in one place. Some guy gets a bunch of stock options, and then all of a sudden, it, it kind of ruins it for all the other shareholders. Um, well, what what makes for a good serial acquirer? Um, I think I, th I think a pretty consistent theme across a lot of them is like a founder or some sort of very large shareholder running the ship, like. Um, at Berkshire, you've got Buffett. At Markel, I'm not sure how much of a position Tom Gaynor, like how much the company he owns, but presumably quite a bit. Um, KPG, you've obviously got Brett Kelly. Uh, Taladine, you had Henry Singleton. Constellation, you've got Mark Leonard. Um, yeah, pretty much every successful one I can find, there's usually someone who's been there a very long time and, and has a big position. Maybe... It uh, has Bonnie Ma also. Yeah. To, to counter on that, I just thought of a couple. Um, it, would, would we count United Health into this? I don't know too much about them, but I know they buy tons of different little insurance companies and kind of roll them up into a few. Um, yeah, I think you could. And, and you might you might lump a lot of the big banks in here too. Chase, Bank of America, they buy all these little banks and or have bought all these little banks and roll them up into their their general arms, uh, their general kind of national arm or international arm, I guess. Uh and uh, also one that uh, on a show Frank and I were on, one of our best ideas shows, I mentioned First American Title. Um, that's in the U.S. kind of title insurance space where, where these are the companies that insure the title of a piece of property uh, against claims that you might not have known about. Um, their strategy has been, at least over the past many years, to, to buy local title insurance branches and roll them up into their big national brand. Um, so th th there probably are quite a few more than we, than we might realize, <laughs> um, just that, because they just kind of do it, they do it quietly and consistently, just keep rolling it up over time. And all of a sudden you end up with a really huge, uh, brand, uh, pretty, pretty under long, the radar. As long as they keep acquiring the same businesses in their field, you can consider them as serial acquirers. The moment yeah. it goes unrelated, that's when they go into conglomerate territory. And yeah, that's, that's when... You have and that's when you need Buffett companies. running it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe that's it. So, so that's for the, the diversified name. conglomerates, you need the really talented founder owner, perhaps. Yeah, I could see that argument, at least um, yeah. based on that sample set you were, you were explaining. Yeah, they all, and, they and all I think that comes to mind is Pepsi, PepsiCo. Um, yeah, Pepsi, the way yeah. they kind of acquired Frito-Lay and Quaker Oats and all that. Entire like they've moved away from drinks to like also food snacks. Yeah. So it's like related, huge company, huge acquisition, but you know, still really, sort of an acquirer model. And really dominant brands too. They've been very successful. Yeah. I would I would think. I don't know if they, there's a bunch of acquisitions that I'm sure they've had acquisitions that haven't panned out well at all, or maybe they overpaid or whatever. Um, well, what do we know when like Pepsi bought? Uh, they own Frito Lay, right? Um, Quaker Oats. Like, yeah. yeah. When uh, do we know when they did that? I, 2001. I've never, so 2001. I've never looked at that deal, but I, I'm curious what the numbers look like there. I'd assume it's worked out quite well, <laughs> seeing the dominance of the brand. So they purchased yeah. Tropicana in 1998 and Quaker Oats in 2001. And what at what prices? And something called Pioneer Foods at. In 2020. Um, so Quaker Oats at 13.8 billion. That's what I'm seeing here. It looks like they paid in stock though. So who no. knows? As I just want to throw one out there, uh, Microsoft, you've got LinkedIn and you've got a position that I hold Activision, Activision Blizzard, which is uh, hopefully going to go through. Those are two extremely large, extremely large yeah. acquisitions. And one of them, obviously, social media, the other one, uh, video games. And so that had me thinking about Microsoft. And I sent you all a link if 
if everyone out there just Googles like uh, mergers and acquisitions, Microsoft, Wikipedia, there's like a crazy list of acquisitions they've done. And um, it is really, really significant. Some of them are like companies that are, they bought for billions and billions of dollars. And then other, uh, many of them, like they don't even have the acquisition price listed because it was a smaller deal. Uh, but I would say they seem like, to me, like a serial acquirer and not just in, not just in software, but I, I guess it's how you want to classify social media and video games, but there's a lot there. Right, my favorite being Skype. I forgot about that one. <laughs> what a missed <laughs> <Yeah>. opportunity. <laughs> um, I, I organized it by market or by the deal sell, uh, deal size. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's probably a fair assumption, especially now they really operate more like a hedge fund at this point. Um, when it comes to growing, it's, it's yeah, it's like some of them, out. some of them worked out, uh, some of them didn't. Like the, uh, I don't think the Nokia phone unit one worked out well. Probably not. Yeah, it's a it's a bit presumptuous to have Activision on there already, isn't it? Yes, I don't it think so. Is. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't it been approved from like majority of the regulators? It's it's almost. No, done, it's right? going to take a long time. It'll be like an antitrust Six case. Six months, and, something. Yeah, it'll be a long time. I bet. Um, assu that's assuming that both parties still want to go through with it by the end of this, which isn't a given. Um, I don't know what if, their if deal. It, if it doesn't, yeah, if it doesn't go through, Activision Blizzard's going to get two or three billion dollars. So, sure, it's a nice little sweetener. So it depends on how bad things are by the time. <laughs> is that $3 billion? And, but this is, this is my point with Microsoft. Like one of the reasons I bought Activision Blizzard and one of the reasons I'm not worried about the acquisition going through because I'm cloning Buffett. But like something that gives me peace of mind is look at those dates. We're only going back to 2021, yeah. 2020, 2019. I, I organized my all most this recent. talk. Yeah, yeah, all this talk about big tech uh, regulators and all that. Look at what Microsoft has been able to pull off on the acquisition front kind of under or not kind of under the radar in a very non-political way, not drawing attention. They know how to play this game. And I think they're going to hopefully pull it off with Activision Blizzard. But isn't this impressive for such a yeah, big company to still be acquiring they owned, all this? I didn't know they owned GitHub. Um, it's like a computer science sort of staple. Um, yeah, that's big. Yeah, the, so LinkedIn was $26 billion in 2016. GitHub was... Seven and a half billion and eighteen. Zeni, what's Zenimax Media? What which uh, what games are those? You say Cinemax? Sorry, Zenimax right here. That was an Zenimax, eight billion okay. dollar deal in twenty twenty. Uh, I'm not familiar with that name. Nuance Communications, which is speech synthesis and speech recognition, it was almost a twenty billion dollar deal in twenty twenty one. I, I feel like I never heard about that one. That's a twenty billion dollar deal right there. Mm. <laughs> and then, then the the one that's made the news, obviously, for good reason. Sixty sixty eight point seven billion dollar Activision Blizzard attempted acquisition. We'll see if that actually closes. But yeah, some serious serious firepower. It's it's fun when you we didn't when consider you Microsoft when you were talking about the punch card portfolio. Why is it what just about? Google and? Meta. <laughs> oh, that that reminds me, Karan. We you need to vote. <laughs> yeah, but why didn't we include Microsoft? Well, if we're we putting did. in big tech, might well, we as were well. talking about the adpocalypse last time, but uh, we right. could do a Microsoft episode in the near future um, if, if the people want it, and if we want to do it too. Um, but yeah, we we're talking about the adpocalypse, so we brought up Google and Meta, and we had our vote, and it was two out of four votes for both of them. So, so you are the, you're the tiebreaker. If there is, if there is one for, uh, for both of these, if we want to add them to the punch card portfolio, are, are you ready to vote? Karan? Isn't it, what happens isn't if it too large? If Karan like stays neutral? Hey, that's up for you to decide if they're too large. Karan, you're the vote. <laughs> oh, definitely. Meta is a no. Like, um, definitely again. no one. Meta. So hold, hold on, hold on. Karan. You want to Frank, to that? Hold on. As Frank pointed out last week, if you vote no on Meta, at these low prices, which by mm -hmm. I've got a story about Meta. We, if you guys want to talk about it, but call it, call your broker. <laughs> it, it might be time to short. Um, if you <laughs> if you don't want to buy Meta right now, that means you would rather buy Turtle Beach at today's prices than Meta. Is that correct? Sure. 
I'll take my chances yeah, with Toby Kukua, man. I agree. Totally. Completely agree. I'll take my chances. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. What about uh, Alphabet? I mean, Google's always a great business. I mean, huge. I think I think it's it's fantastic. But does it fit in the punch card portfolio? Does it fit? Like you already have you a lot us. of large that, tech. That is not for you to decide. <laughs> no, but we, we already have a lot of large tech. We, like I mean, we do. We and and like, what's, what'll be funny is if our portfolio ends up just being like Fang. <laughs> yeah, it's an index fund at some point, yeah, right? Yeah, it just, it just Karan, Karan, you can always, <laughs> you can always say no if you've got what you think is a better idea that. We'll all agree on next week, you know. Yeah, I, mean, I think I think we can always find something a bit smaller or something that's, you know, actually. It, a bunch you're worried of about the limited position. upside. You're worried about the limited upside because it's too big. Is that it? It's not that. Like we already have process. We have Alibaba in there. So do we really need more tech, like large tech? Jason's freaking out over there. So, so is it a diversification? <laughs> what What is it exactly? I mean. See, would I pick Total Beach over Meta? Yeah. Would I pick Total Beach over Google? I don't know. I mean, but then again, it's for the people to decide, is it Total Beach or is it going to be KPG or is it going to be Process or what's going to be replaced? That's for the audience to decide, right? So. Yeah. So. so yeah, you don't get to pick which one's out. But yeah, let's put in Google. Let's see what the people choose. Oh, so, 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 <laughs> we, we have our first yes. Wow! <laughs> Has someone got a got a hole punch? Yeah, yeah. We need let's to see what the people about. choose. Yeah, let's try it. Ah, it. Took a turn. Yeah, you know, I thought you were talking yourself out of it, but you ended up talking yourself into it. Well, that, I that, I'm that, huge that fan of Google. First, like honestly, it's one of the best the businesses. New yeah. acquisition for the punch card portfolio. We're going to be doing a vote uh, sometime this week. So be on the lookout, everyone. Uh, applause is in the chat if that's what you want to do, because uh, this is exciting. One of our stocks is going to be out. Google will be in. We'll see for how long. And uh, yeah, that's it. All right, I'm going to turn off uh, Hallelujah right now. Yeah. <laughs> but, and but, please uh, vote for Turtle Beach to get out, everyone. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Buy high, sell low. Okay. So, so what's, <laughs> what, what, what can they... What can they vote on? Turtle Beach. What else is all, in there? All of them. All of them. Heritage, Alibaba, Sir? Process. Yeah. <clears throat> Alibaba, Alibaba, KPG, Process, and KPG. Process Heritage, uh, KPG, and Turtle Beach. Those are, those are, those are the five. Jack, it's um, not looking good right now. Which it's is a real shame because uh, those five <laughs> selling it at like a hundred million dollar valuation is a little rough. <laughs> Jack, think about it. Like, Heritage has told us they're liquidating. They, they've told us. We're yeah. out, <laughs> and people are still taking shots. I know. I know. The Seritage is like, how much? How much can you squeeze out now? Like, you've you've tapped, you've tapped a lot out, and you could get quite a bit more, but you know, your upside is definitely fixed because um, they're they're literally winding up. Um, so yeah, but we have upside. The that's downside. the point. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that that's true. But you do have downside too with, with SRG. Um, so so yeah. how how are people going to vote? How are we all going to vote, us listeners? Community post. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. That's what yeah, Discord thought, kicks in, right? Yeah, we'll have a community post. Um, okay. With the with the four of them, yeah, with the five of them, um, and uh, can you do five? I think you can do five options in a poll because that'd be really awkward if it's only four. <laughs> um, I think you can do five options in a poll. If we need to do runoffs, we'll do runoffs. But uh, maybe we do that. We'll do so. We'll do five. And then if no one gets a majority to get kicked off, we'll do like a runoff poll or something like that. Is, is that agreeable? Because you, you wouldn't want one to like you only get fifteen percent of the vote and and you know be booted off or something like that. Or I guess it would have to be over twenty, right? Um, I don't know how this math would work. <laughs> so if one of them gets like twenty five percent and then gets booted off, it feels a little rough. Um, Let's yeah. see what so the we, results are like. like. Yeah, if it goes like fifty percent in one, then we know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Are we gonna um, have to? Are we gonna have to think about rebalancing, or are we just? Um... No, no. Whatever's out, will uh, that'll be the plus. That'll be annoying for for you, Tom. Uh, so Google's the gonna site. be a tiny little position, potentially, or if, or if it's KPG, if everyone just wants to get out of there, <laughs> that's probably not the worst idea. I reckon. Yeah, so sell high if if you count it as high. Um, yeah, big profits on. I mean, after Shaq joined the board, and was is he on the board or what? <laughs> on the board, I think he's. I the think CEO. he's got Hasbulla also on the on. The... 
<laughs> I, so, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to get worried did. about KPG there. Yeah. But before we move on, just one more. Do we want to have like, I don't want to say like a, a sentence or like a quick pitch or a write up for us to, for, for defending each of the stocks or not. Um, that could be kind of funny. Or, or we just say like, uh, each of us gets a sentence to say like what we what we like about our initial picks and which one we think should go or something like that. Yeah, you should, can try to. Like should we do that right is. now? No, but let's do it like on the post. I mean, like because you can put. I think you can put like a description in there or something. We'll, we'll figure it out. But uh, and then yeah, right at the top, say, like put... if someone wants to take out process, like go for it. Re <laughs> replace process with Google. It's a too much China. It's genuinely better for the portfolio. Yeah. Yeah, we can like take out Dota Beach later also. Like, yeah, personally, we're very heavily on China, which has me a little, yeah. a little feeling a little weird. <laughs> so, but should we? That's yeah. the point. Should we do this sort of like a? Should we do this sort of like a typical, um, you know, shareholder meeting where we put out like a board recommendation of what people people vote for? <laughs> like. Do we do we need an attorney to draft this? <laughs> well, I don't know if you know anyone. File, it the SEC. File it for our spec. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, anyways, that's coming up. So be on the lookout for that, everyone. Um, what what exciting times! It's been like a year since we had this portfolio up, right? Almost something like that. Yeah. So Close to one it. year in. Jack is um <laughs> is um is Turtle Beach undervalued or is the business gonna die? It's not, it's not going to die. Like, they don't have any debt. Um, what's annoying is just the management drama because they're, yeah, it's, it's just a bunch of stupid management drama things with like this potential takeover and everything and potentially trying to sell the company. So there's just a lot of uncertainty and everyone hates it naturally because like who knows what's going to happen there. Um, but they like they're, they're cyclical with the video game industry. And right now it's going down. I bought it towards the height of, of the cycle naively thinking that they could pivot into PC parts, which they did. And y y despite that, people don't like seeing the declining everything. They bought all their inventory at pretty high levels, but um, it just, it would feel painful to sell now, given that they're, you know, if, if we're, if we're towards the bottom of a, of a cycle, you know, that's the time that you would want to hold on waiting for the cycle to come up. If you believe in that sort of thing. Um, yeah. The time to sell would have been <laughs> six months ago, but oh, well, hindsight's 2020. <laughs> Yeah. Um, personally, I'm holding. So, if that says anything. Uh, all right. I what's a, next? I got I got a couple for you guys in the uh, oil and gas space. I you know after I'm thinking about it, I do own a, a very true serial acquirer. Uh, it's called Earthstone Energy, and they do business in uh, prime. I think Texas, the Midland Basin, and also the Permian Basin, oil and gas company. And we're going to look, I think, at their most recent presentation, and we can look at the acquisitions they've made. Uh, they've done it with cash and stock, and they've grown the reserves. They've grown the production. And when you grow the production of an oil and gas company, you, you grow the revenue. Um, and the stock price is up uh, since they started doing this in late 2020 from like two and a half bucks to 17 bucks. And What's um, that ticker symbol? E-S-T-E. And I've got a link for you to their presentation. How'd you find the idea? Um, so I've been in Ring Energy for a few years, and I'm actually remembering it. There was a, a YouTube video from some kind of like oil and gas industry magazine, something like that. And they were interviewing one of the investor relation guys from Ring Energy. And at, on the same kind of Zoom calls during the pandemic, they had on Robert Anderson from Earthstone Energy, and the guy is very charismatic. Um, you can just tell he loves doing what he does. He loves oil and gas. He loves going out there and finding oil and gas in the ground. And he was so like charismatic, and I learned so much from that call. Just kind of stuck on my radar, and unfortunately, I did not buy the stock until recently, uh, but I was aware of it during... Uh, I think 2020, uh, maybe early 2021. And I had been aware of their plan, like they're going to go out and acquire oil and gas assets. And the plan has worked out like really, really good. So it's been really fun to watch that because they just go out there and get more 
reserves, get more oil and gas, and headquarters doesn't really have to grow hardly at all. Um, it's all it's all about the price you pay for it. And on that presentation, you can uh, you can see how much how much their reserves have have grown. And one of the way they communicate to investors is like, look what we went out and just bought. We went out and bought these proven, developed, producing reserves. Look what we paid for it. We paid for less than the proven developed reserves. We're getting a lot for our money. And you can kind of see their their mindset about how they go about uh, their acquisitions. And I'm reading here, across all six significant transactions, proved developed value of reserves has underpinned the purchase price. So yeah. just like and I what, go out there and, and I go buy Ring and Earthstone for less than the proven reserves, that's what this guy's doing too, just in the form of a public company. I was looking real quick at debt and and shares. Both are climbing rapidly, so they're obviously using that to acquire and to make these acquisitions because they don't have a ton of cash, and barely any at all, actually. Yeah. Um, so debt debt's kind of exploded up to over a billion dollars, and I think it was let's say it's a one point seven billion dollar market cap right now. Um, I'm not sure what the reserve levels are. They could still be getting a great deal, of course, making that worth it, but just something to keep an eye on. Um, and uh, shares are up <laughs> um, 2x in the last two years, um, a little bit more than that, actually. So sh shares yeah. growing a lot, revenue yeah, growing even more. You, with that. You, go, you go back to the spring in, of 2020, and it's it was like a $2 stock, and now it's up to almost 17 Jack, I'm just, I'm just wondering if you could give us book value per share. That's probably the best... Um measure for something like this well why don't you uh, why don't you pull up that presentation um i'll show i'll show you guys kind of how they look at things get get you a net yeah. asset value per share how they advertise things <laughs> all right here we go uh where should i go yeah go down a little um right there so this is a good place to look so you've got 4.8 billion dollars i mean look how how simple they make it for you. You've got a Midland Basin, like I talked about, Delaware over in New Mexico and, and uh, West Texas. You got a $2.3 billion market cap. You got debt, $1.2 billion net debt. So you got an enterprise value. What does it take to buy the whole business? $3.5 billion. But you go up a little bit and you can see their, their PV10, their uh, reserves uh, at strip prices um, whenever this came out recently. Uh, four point eight billion dollars. So, like the whole business is selling for three point five. The value of the reserves at today's price is almost five billion. Um, if you scroll down a little, you can see the the value they've created. I think it's page six. You can check out these. Look what they've done with this business since twenty twenty. So, first column there, fiscal year twenty twenty. They just start off as Earthstone Energy, fifteen thousand uh, barrels of oil equivalent per day production. And now they're they're at over a hundred thousand uh, barrels of of oil equivalent uh, per day, and you can see the mix of cash and stock, proven developed reserves, how they've grown those, uh, or what they've acquired each time, and uh, it, it's been pretty awesome. Now the question is like, who are they buying? Um, my understanding is a lot of the or all of these are pretty much private businesses, and I think a lot of them had been private equity backed companies who got into shale and got into the Permian when uh, oil was, was very high. And then it crashed in uh, 2015, 2016 crashed again in 2020. And those guys sure. are kind of trying to, trying to get out and serial acquirers like this guy who really know what they're doing and know what they're buying um, have been able to take advantage of it. Yeah. It fits the mold for sure. And I, uh, I wonder just maybe this is too, too macro, but if you're worried about like the political climate and, a lot of new oil expert exploration really isn't happening when you're buying the existing stock of wells that that could be a lot more attractive because if you're not expecting too many more wells to come online in the near future or even distant future you know, when you can buy the existing stock you'll be in a good good spot theoretically but that yeah, might unless, be a little too macro unless it all gets one full text away yeah sure or whatever away yeah. <laughs> Yeah, oil is outlawed. <laughs> so, yeah. Have you looked at the refiners much, or what, Karan? Really, the refiners in the space. 
I don't know any. I don't know anything about refineries. I just know that uh, Carl Icahn has one of them, and he likes it. Um, that's what he says. That's it's, he says it's hard to build a new one. Yeah, I, I don't know much about that business. Um, I know they talk about the crack spread a lot. Uh, that can be taken a few different ways, but um, I don't know much. Uh, I don't know much about that industry. The midstream. Yeah. Or the downstream. Well, I think the real question here then would be what would happen if oil prices fell significantly, given that they just took down a pretty big debt yeah. load? Um, how much of a problem would that be? I don't know what these things cost to run. Jack, what would what would happen if the if the sun didn't come up tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, well, of, well <laughs> you have to you have to know what you're getting into, obviously. And when it's a commodity based mm -hmm. business, the commodity prices matter a lot. Especially yep. in this case, where you're literally pulling the oil out, that is the product. Um, so it, it's definitely relevant, especially when you got debt involved. Um, it definitely is relevant. The, the way the way I kind of look at it as an oil and gas investor or an oil investor is I kind of look at what where the price of oil could go, not like in a short term scare like the coronavirus, where no one knew what was happening until it crashed, yeah. but then it came back up because people need oil. But I kind of look at like sixty dollars as maybe the long term cheapest it'll get. And one of my other holdings, Ring Energy, they still make money at that price. And there's something crazy going on with them. Like the the value of their reserves take away the debt. The value of their reserves at sixty dollar oil potentially is still larger than the price of the business today. So I, I do I do consider that for sure. Okay, so. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. I wasn't <laughs> suggesting that oil would go to zero or something. I got um, defenses. I, I apologize. We're yeah. constantly under attack. You know what I mean, Jack? <laughs> yeah, Ring's got some weird stuff going on with their financing from memory, but uh, also from memory, it seems like that might be about to get ironed out, which could get interesting. Like, is that I, a I shot? think with is that a shot at Ring? No, no. I'm saying. Are you sure? No, Are you talking your book? <laughs> Sorry, I got defensive I, again. I got to take it. Yeah, drink. no, I got I got points <laughs> on ring. No, I don't. Uh, <laughs> no, I was just saying, like, I, I was listening to some ring, um, you know, conference calls when I was first getting interested in this stuff. And um, I think with their lending at the time, they couldn't do buybacks or pay dividends from memory. Um, yeah, but with I, the recent I, I thought acquisition that's what they've might made, be, that might be changing. I think yeah. that's what you might be talking about. And that's that, for, from my understanding, that's pretty standard for this space, like very small oil and gas companies. Like, what I found out during the pandemic when the price of oil crashed, the banks who loan to these oil and gas companies pretty much own these oil and gas companies and call the shots. And when you have a lot of debt and you're very you're a very small company, the banks pretty much tell you what you can do. And like you're saying, Tom, for a while, they haven't been able to do buybacks or pay dividends because the banks are requiring them to kind of like conserve the money they do make to make sure the banks uh, get paid, but that ring is another example of like how an acquisition can be a really good thing because recently they went out, increased their debt, but because they increased their debt to go buy oil and gas assets at a pretty good price, they were able to increase their reserves per share. They were able to increase their assets compared to the debt on a relative basis, and they were able to like increase the uh the EBITDA ratio to their to their debt or whatever and basically taking on more debt to go buy other assets made them kind of less debt intensive and less at risk of the debt if you will so it was interesting to see that happen recently yeah i think there was some st that's the stronghold acquisition right yeah stronghold um yeah. The stronghold I th assets I think yeah yeah, I think there was some stock involved in that as well. It's kind of like a, it's like the reverse of the process situation. It's like if process was selling at a premium to NAV and they issued shares to go buy more 10 cent, it's, that's kind of what's happening with these companies, right? Like they're, well, know, they're, I mean, they're, I mean, they're, Ring, they're, unfortunately, was like, I did, it's not fun to have them go issue shares because at the time they were selling for less than their net asset value, but it's just like they had a lot of debt and it was a good thing to like, you know, increase the share count a little bit to go get other assets and make them less at risk of, of having a, a debt problem. But it's yeah. kind of counterintuitive uh, but, the first time you, you, uh, you see it. For sure. I, but I mean, even with issuing shares, like the reserves per share have gone up because they. Exactly. Because they got stuff at a good price. Yeah. 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 Price matters. What's, what's holding you back, Tom? What's holding you back? <laughs> Come on in. The water's nice. Thank you, Jonathan, for your consistent 
uh, super chats. He, he sent he sent us a one ninety nine dollar ninety nine uh, super chat saying my S and P five hundred dividend. See y'all in Omaha for the punch card fund. Appreciate it. Um, pivoting a little bit here, Doctor Ali Dogar says, please have a quick look at uh, HK two one two seven Huizen household. I don't know how to say that of the the super chat here. Um, he says that they are a PE of one, almost no debt. Uh, 75% founder ownership. Biggest buyers are Walmart and Home Depot. Income is growing. I guess they sell furniture products for home office commercial use in China. China. The company, yeah, basically furniture and panel furniture. Apparently this stuff sold at Home Depot and Walmart. Um, and it is taking a beating in the last year, down eighty six percent almost. I, I've I had never heard of this, but it's sort of like the uh, um, the wholesaler for uh, or manufacturer, I guess, for a lot of these big box stores. It sounds like. Let's take a look at that balance sheet real quick. Can we just see if it's a PE of one of, of like off huge earnings or something weird? Because then it's not really a PE of one, is it? If you go like income statement and look at what the oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know earnings um, have done. So wait, what's the uh what's the cap? Uh, market cap of all right, let me switch it to US dollars. Um 127 million dollars. You should know that cap. in your head, Jack. Yeah, right. <laughs> is that Lilo? It's, Lee, Lee it's a Lilo <laughs> joke right there. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, coming down here, I think these Negative are all, enterprise value. I these are all still in uh, yuan, so just keep that in mind. There we go. <clears throat> um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm gonna yeah. buy some tonight, <laughs> real quick. Show or like the the company in the shares. The <laughs> yeah. Hey Tom, Tom, I just I gotta apologize for lashing out at you when you when I when I misunderstood your question about Ring. You have to understand, as a small business, we had been under attack from like I felt like from like a bunch of BS from short sellers uh, for the last few years before they kind of took off again. And there would be these guys making like YouTube videos and online posts, just like saying the craziest things about ring and their financials but saying them over and over and over and obviously as a carvana shareholder i've i've been dealing with my fair share of that as well so i was out of line and and i they're, apologize they're, they're out for you specifically jason as the owner it's the way, of the it's the way it feels it's the way it feels jason this jason this is this is why uh warren lives in omaha so he doesn't have to deal with that sort of thing yeah i agree i agree Small, and uh and uh yeah, in a modest neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. So, what's the verdict on a cereal acquired? Do you guys are you guys attracted to it, or does it scare you away? Well, I, I own a couple of them, and yeah, decent Def size. So, I, I think it's pretty market dependent. Some markets, this it would be a lot more prone for this sort of thing. Yeah, the more inefficient the market, the better, I guess. Um, or I guess the more illiquid. If you can find that one acquirer that's gobbling them all up, like there you go. That's a that's a potentially great opportunity. Um, the best case scenario, they become a monopoly, right? So right, right. The the, the zero to one sort of deal. <laughs> monopoly in their niche. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I I think you just have to know the playbook and try, have good faith in the management. You know, um, it's probably about all it comes down to. Yeah. You know, with uh, with KPG or something, the playbook's pretty straightforward. Like they're gonna initially start acquiring a bunch of accounting firms in Sydney, and then move to other Australian cities, and then presumably move out of Australia at some point. Um, you know, with Thor or whatever, it's buy RV brands every so often. Um, and with Berkshire, it's a bit more unpredictable, but you've also got Warren Buffett running it. So I think you just gotta know it, the playbook it, and have faith that they'll keep running it really if, if for some reason it feels like more of a leap of faith for management um like you have to trust the management totally. more for some reason when it's acquisitions 
but, yeah. but that doesn't sound right but that's what it feels like well it is it is right i think because you're not getting the yeah. cash back like you would in a typical business they're taking all your cash and funneling and funneling it uh, yeah into i guess so i guess flow, so you know yeah it's the it's the it's truly a capital allocation decision which is like purely management i guess yeah, i guess that's right yeah yeah so yeah, I guess it, it really is a management deal then. I feel like it's very asymmetric. Like they're either very, very good yeah. at it and it's going to pay off huge or it's like you're going to get yourself in trouble. That, it, like that, it, you can't be mediocre at it. That's what Frank said in the chat uh, right at yeah, the top really. of the show. 80% fail, but the ones that succeed tend to do real well because of that. Um, yeah, I, I think what should be scary to you as an investor is if you're in some company that's not a serial acquirer and then they announce some huge acquisition that they've got no track record that tells you whether it's going to work out or not and they're doing <laughs> it with like some huge chunk of the company, you know. Um, and I'm sure plenty of those have worked, but there's a lot more probably that haven't done so well. Yeah, it's it's yeah when it's in the DNA, it's different than when it's like, all right, we don't know what to do anymore. Time to just throw money at some neighboring business that seems okay at any price. Yeah, so, yeah. Sometimes it's not that naive. I, I can't remember the super investor who was talking about this, but when I heard him talk about it, I was like, okay, that's really, really smart. And they were talking about digging into the incentives of management. And sometimes the incentives just, if they grow revenues, grow the company, even taking the company at risk, but they grow, uh, they get paid a lot more quickly. Uh, so you have to look mm -hmm. at that as well. Uh, and I think a sweet spot would be like someone who does not have those incentives, but is incentivized in a true way, meaning like they own a ton of the stock um, yeah. and they want to see the business do well. That, that goes to yeah. what Tom was saying with the, uh, the, the the founder, large shareholder. Uh, maybe that explains it um, when the incentives are aligned because yeah. they just own the business. They, they're not getting all these metrics uh, that uh, yeah. oh. up their stock-based compensation and whatnot. Yeah, or, or they get incentivized on um, return on investor capital or something rather sure. than revenue growth or, you know. Yeah, even then you could get a little, That's that'd be a harder one to fudge, that's for sure. But yeah, you, you could definitely focus on the short term a lot more than the long term. Yeah. Yeah, I all believe right. that's how uh, Orthwine's structured all the Thor incentives for a lot of that <laughs> management team. Oh, so. we didn't even talk about Thor, man. Uh, yeah. and, uh, trying, trying to wrap up here. We're at our People hour. People have heard enough. Yeah. <laughs> go go watch some other Thor episode from Tom. He's got plenty. They're all good stuff. Um, alrighty. Well, I think that's a good spot to wrap up then. Uh, quick chat on... A quick chat. That hour went by quickly. J Jason, thanks for coming on halfway through the show. Appreciate oh, it. Oh, yeah, no Again, problem, yeah. My very, pleasure. very, Thank you. very short notice. Um, no, literally no, as the show started, no, don't worry about <laughs> as it. As the show started, I'm like, Hey Jason, you want to join us? And you're like, I joined. Yes. No, it was, it was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> um, it was great to check in with you guys and see you guys. It's been a crazy week in the market. So it's good to see some crazy. Jason, you better tell us how are the, how's uh, the leaps on Carvana doing? <laughs> better share that. As a closer. We saw what the stock's been doing over the last two days. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, some of them are up, uh, like, uh, 50, 60, 70%. The um, stock is up 50% right, in the last two days. Oh, then, yeah. I mean, maybe in the last couple of days, some of them are... I, I think like today, one of them was up like 45% just today, and it was up yesterday. <laughs> so they, they move a little different uh, than the, the stock, like sometimes because there's yeah. not as much activity. But that, it takes that, a day uh, or two to kick in. That Those are... The implied volatility and whatnot. There's, that, mm -hmm. It's probably super high right now with <laughs> the crazy moves. Got to have a what's, stomach for what, that one. What's the duration on those things, Jason? Is it super, yeah. like we're talking multiple years, are we? One week. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 yeah. Sure, yeah. I've, so I've, I've bought leaps in Suncor Energy recently and also Carvana and also Paramount. And all of them are as long as I could go out, which was January of 2025. So in some sense, it sounds like pretty close like a couple years but in another sense like that's over two years away and, and a lot of good things can happen for those businesses in in two years uh so it's been fun to kind of get into that a little leverage <laughs> never hurt anyone right <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Wait, who was our sponsor today again <laughs> <laughs> FTX. Uh, no, 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 <laughs> FTX. <laughs> uh, all righty Thanks, everyone. Um, like, comment, subscribe. Check out the links in the description. You know what to do. Um, but otherwise, till, till next time, everyone. See ya.
Thanks for tuning in to Punch Card Investing. The contents of this show should not be used as investment advice or as a recommendation to invest in a particular security. Please consult with a licensed investment advisor if you need investment advice. All investments carry risk and the potential for monetary loss. Thank you and see you next week.